So we are going to continue with uh, what we were discussing in the last class. So this lecture will be on the learning mechanisms in neural networks, but uh, especially we will consider on the three types of learning mechanism. One is the Habian learning which uh, we had uh, left incomplete in the last class and then we are also going to discuss about the competitive learning and finally the fifth mechanism which is the Boltzmann learning. So this will be the scope of our discussion for today. Uh, in fact, uh, as you uh, had seen in the last class that uh, we can define five basic learning rules okay? and out of that error correction learning and the memory based learning we have already discussed and it was Habian learning which we were considering towards the end of the class. Uh, in fact, for Habian learning as we had uh, discussed already that uh, it is uh, I mean quite supported by the neurophysiological evidence that our brain also performs to some extent at least some region of the brain do perform this kind of a Habian learning. And the mechanism that follows for the Habian learning is that when a cell fires another cell in that case the uh, metabolic process should be such that the synaptic connection of uh, such cells okay, they are strengthened meaning that next time there will be a greater uh, strength of cell A firing the cell B. Okay. And this when translated in terms of the neural network we had seen that we can define it this way that if you have two neurons one defined as the presynaptic neuron and the other as the post synaptic neuron connected to each other by the synaptic weight. Okay. The, in, in that case if at a given time instant both the synaptic I mean both the presynaptic as well as the post synaptic they show the similar excitation if both of them are active together okay. in that case the synaptic connection of that will be strengthened. Okay. So, uh, that is the uh, I mean essentially what uh, we are going to have for the artificial neural network when we implement the Habian learning mechanism. Okay. So, such synapses uh, we are referring to as the Habian synapses. So, it is Habian synapses and, and Habian synapses has got three characteristics. Firstly is that it is very much time dependent. So, as we already uh, emphasized that the um, I mean pre synaptic and the post synaptic neurons activation okay, they should be occurring at the same time that is to say that they must occur synchronously. So, if they are not synchronous if they are asynchronous in nature then we are not going to have the strengthening then we are going to follow a weakening. So, it is very much time dependent. The second thing is that it is highly local in nature that means to say that the synaptic weight adjustment is very much dependent upon the post synaptic and the pre synaptic neuron only. So, it is absolutely local okay. it is not dependent upon the other neurons. So, it is definitely following a kind of a spatio temporal contiguity. And the third thing is that it is strongly interactive and strong interactivity in this case means that there are true interactions between the both the ends of the synapse. So, if we consider the synapse then the pre synaptic and the post synaptic neurons okay, they are surely interactive with each other. Okay. Now, as we had already shown that the positive correlation okay, if the pre synaptic and the post synaptic they happen to be positively correlated then the positive correlation leads to a synaptic strengthening.
whereas if they happen to be uncorrelated uncorrelated in the sense that uh, one does not affect the other okay then we can say that it is uncorrelated or it could be negatively correlated like i mean if it is such that supposing we define a binary state of the neurons it could be in the plus 1 state or minus 1 state and for such kind of binary activations if it is such that when cell a which is to be regarded as the presynaptic that goes to a state of plus 1 and the postsynaptic that is at a state of minus 1 at the same time synchronously then we can define that to be a negative correlation and a habian mechanism simply means that in case of such negative correlation we can have a i mean we are going to have a synaptic weakening okay now this is surely what uh, we can uh, um, i mean expect that positive correlation should lead to strengthening and negative correlation should lead to weakening but whether uncorrelated should lead to a strengthening or a weakening or it remains the same that is one issue on which one can debate upon okay so although i said here that uncorrelated um, i mean i mean any any kind of uncorrelation between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neurons okay they lead to weakening i mean one can also uh, define the habian learning mechanism in such a way that there is neither strengthening nor weakening in fact based on this we can develop three different classifications for synaptic modifications so the classifications of synaptic modification could be stated as follows one mechanism is the habian synaptic modification as we have already uh, seen that the synapse that increases its strength with positive correlation a second category of synaptic modification one can think over okay that is called as the antihabian and what is antihabian antihabian means something that behaves exactly opposite to how the habian learning mechanism behaves that means to say that if you have negative correlation if one end of the synapse says minus 1 and the other end of the synapse says plus 1 in that case you should strengthen that okay so that means to say that the synapse in the case of antihabian it increases its strength but not with positive correlation but with negative correlation and the third classification that we are going to define is a non-habian and what is a non-habian? Non-habian means that which does not involve habian mechanism of either kind. Is it okay? I think it is fairly simple to understand that strengthening, I mean habian means with positive correlation there is a strengthening, antihabian means with negative correlation there is a strengthening and vice versa. I mean that means to say that uh, when you have antihabian and there is a positive correlation it leads to weakening obviously and non-habian means which does not follow either habian or antihabian. Okay? Now, we are going to see the mathematical model for 
Hebbian modifications. Okay. Now, in a, I mean, when stated in a very simple way, okay. So this is the mathematical model of Hebbian modifications. And this can be stated as follows that delta w k j okay, at the time step n okay, that is surely a function of y k n and x j n. And I think we have already defined the uh, nomenclature for this. It necessarily means that w k j happens to be the synaptic strength between the neuron j and the neuron k. Okay. I mean from neuron j to neuron k that means to say and x j is the input neuron and y k is the output and what you are seeing within the parenthesis n is the definition that we have at the time step n. Now, surely the change of weight that has to take place has to be a function of the presynaptic that is x j of n is the presynaptic signal and y k of n which happens to be the postsynaptic signal. So, it is definitely a function of that and if we are going to have a positive correlation as is the case with the Hebbian synapse in that case one has to show the positive correlation in the form of some mathematical expression because just telling function f does not mean that whether it is showing a positive correlation or a negative correlation it can show either. Now, it is according to Hebb's hypothesis that we can define the delta w k j at the time step n as the product of the uh, post synaptic and the pre synaptic signals which means to say y k of n times x j of n not exactly a product, but the product multiplied by the learning rate. So, eta as usual is our learning rate. So, it is eta y k n x j n. In fact, this expression the one which I had just now written this is defined as the activity product rule. This is also called the activity product rule. Now, if we plot these, okay, in fact, uh, by keeping x j constant, let us say that we keep the x j constant, we vary y k, okay. eta is of course, a constant because eta is a learning parameter. So, keeping eta constant, keeping the x j also constant, we plot delta w k j versus y k. So, what it is, is it going to be? It is going to be a straight line, a straight line that passes through the origin simply. So, it is curve is going to be simply this that we will be having y k on this axis and delta w k j on the y axis and according to Hibbs hypothesis we are going to have a straight line of slope is equal to eta x j okay. and this straight line okay, is going to uh, obviously pass through the origin that is very clear from here. Right? So, now uh, if we analyze the behavior of this network, okay, what is it going to be? Okay? Supposing we keep the x j s strength the same. Let us say that we keep the x j to be the same. That means to say that according to this curve, we will be getting some y k okay, and that necessarily means that there is a delta w k j, some positive delta w k j will be there. Okay. Supposing already the w k j is positive. Okay. So, whenever we have got a constant uh, x j, then we will be having a positive y k necessarily and positive y k will mean that there is a positive delta w k j, 
which means to say that W k j furthermore increases. So, if we begin with say this value of W k, uh, this value of y k let us say, okay, we are going to have this much of delta W k j added to our W k j. So, the next time in the next uh, time step the W k j that we are going to have is W k j plus delta W k j and that will necessarily mean that with the same x j with a constant x j we are uh, going to have an increased y k and increased y k necessarily means that we are going to have an increased w k j and increased w k j will mean that weight will be further more increased. So, y k will be further more increased and this keeps building up. So, in the end what happens? Where is the limit? So, it is going to have an exponential growth is not it? I mean we are going to show the delta w k j versus y k, but if we are seeing w k j versus y k, okay, in that case it is going to follow an exponential growth surely. And where is the limit? Where does it end? Does it continue forever? Does it continue? Does it continuously go? go uh, I mean uh, will it continuously uh, uh, take place? No, certainly there has to be somewhere some saturation. So, there will be a stage where the synaptic weight or the synaptic strength reaches its saturation value and beyond that point there will not be any further learning. right? So, obviously, this poses some kind of a limitation. Okay. Now, the original Hibbs hypothesis has been somewhat modified by proposing what is called as the covariance hypothesis. In the case of covariance hypothesis, we are going to take a very similar kind of a mechanism that is delta w k j will still be treated as a function of y k and x j, but only thing is that in the case of the covariance hypothesis we are not going to take the product as it is not eta y k x j, but instead of taking it to be y k and x j, we are going to consider its strength above some average value. Okay. So, if we define some time averaged value of x j and some time averaged value of y k, okay. let us say that x bar is the time averaged value of x j. And let us take uh, y bar to be the time averaged value of y k. Right? So, this uh, we can then write the covariance hypothesis as delta w k j equal to eta x j minus x bar y k minus y bar. Okay. And in this case, if we keep the synaptic uh, strength to be, con I mean if we take the input to be the same, let us say that we keep the input at x j only and I mean it is average, average does not mean that it is average for the x j only, I mean average over the entire system. I mean if you are having uh, several inputs which you are going to have surely. So, considering it is average effect which is going to be x bar, so x bar also will be some constant. I mean at a given time x bar is going to be a constant and x j is also going to be a constant. Okay. And then let us see that what the learning means in this case. So, in this case if we are going to plot the same thing that is delta w k j we plot as a function of y k. In this case what happens is that the I mean we are also going to get the same straight line. I mean we are also going to get a straight line in this case. But in this case the slope of that straight line is going to be not eta x j, but eta 
x j minus x bar. So, we are going to have the slope of the line as eta x j minus x bar. So, this is going to be the slope of the straight line that uh, we are going to draw over here. And this straight line when you uh, draw it fully that should uh, intersect with the y axis at which point it is going to intersect it as minus eta x j minus x bar y bar that is good right. So, it is going to intersect over here and this is going to be our maximum depression point. So, in this case you can see that it is not that all the time delta w k j has to increase only delta w k j I mean when y k is equal to uh, y bar in that case delta w k j is going to be equal to 0 and above that it is going to be positive above uh, below that it is going to be negative. So, covariance hypothesis has got a stability effect. Yes, any questions on this? What do you mean by time average value of x j? Time average value of x j means you take all the x j's, all the inputs okay, and it is time averaged behavior, it is time averaged uh, st uh, strength that is all. See, this is only the learning equation. Okay. That means to say that for a given x j, okay, we are going to find out that how much of delta w k j we are having. All right. So, uh, I mean once that is adjusted, so during the time on which you are updating this w k j, you are assuming that the signal strength is not changing. Okay. In fact, I mean this is true for a stationary environment. One thing which I think you must uh, try to think of that neural network when we are putting neural network into any practical system okay, that time one inherent assumption that we have to make it is that the neural network is working in a stationary environment. Stationary environment in the sense that its environment is not dynamically changing. It is not that within the time which you take in order to adjust this weight delta w k I mean by an amount delta w k j the input also changes. Although strictly speaking it is not always very practical you may be having some kind of uh, non stationarity also in which case the neural network has to be more adaptive more adaptive to non stationary behavior. But even non stationary behavior also means that for a very short time we can model it as a stationary. So, I mean there is nothing wrong in assuming that the input is going to remain at the same strength by the time this delta w k j is arranged. Any other question? So, what that means is then if we have a series of inputs yeah. then x bar is an average of all those inputs. Which is equal to x, x bar is an average of all those inputs so very correct. Why should all those inputs affect my weight from this x j to w k uh, y k? Why should all the other inputs affect this weight? This is this is just an average behavior from an average behavior point of view. Okay, that uh, okay. I mean, uh, if you are, uh, I mean, I mean, assuming that all the inputs are equally likely. Okay, in a system. Okay, it's not uh, uh, that always you have to take it to be the average over the system. I mean you can consider that even x j also may be slowly changing. Okay. So, you could take an averaged effect of that depends what type of time averaging you are doing. I mean doing average over the set of neurons that you are having or doing average over only the neuron that you are considering. Okay. It is only over and above some average that we are considering in the case of a covariance hypothesis. Okay. Now, one thing that, yes please. So, in this, if me, for 
Yeah. Exactly, exactly so, exactly so. In fact, I mean we can summarize it as follows that the WKJ is going to increase, the increase I am just denoting by this symbol, okay. If XJ happens to be X bar, that means to say that suddenly if it is, in fact, uh, I mean let me answer to the earlier question in a better way that instead of taking it to be, I mean if you are uh, having uh, any, um, uh, I mean problems in imagining that how is it going to be over a system. Let us consider only one presynaptic and one postsynaptic neuron only, okay. Even then also there is uh, no harm in conceptualizing that okay, X bar is the time averaged strength of X j, all right. So, this is uh, as it is. So, that means to say that if it is such that x j is greater than x bar okay, and y k is greater than y bar, in that case w k j is going to be increasing. That is very clear from here, because x j minus x bar is positive, y k minus y bar is positive, eta is positive, delta w k j is positive. That means to say w k j increases in its strength. Okay. So, that is one of the behavior and we are also going to have a decrease of W k j, W k j decreasing if what either we have that x j is greater than x bar and y k less than y bar. If that is the case then W, w k j decreases in strength or also the other way that means to say if we have x j less than x bar and y k greater than y bar. Okay. So, this uh, is what the covariance hypothesis is giving us. Okay. Exactly, if, if x j is less than x bar and y k is less than y bar, then also you are going to have a increase. have an increase, which is obviously Habian. That means to say that if both x j and uh, y k, they are decreasing from their average strength, then you are going to strengthen it up. So, again x j less than x j less than x bar and y k less than y bar necessarily means that the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neurons are again positively correlated, is it? Okay. So, in fact, there is a strong physiological evidence of Hebbian learning going on in our brain. In fact, uh, the area of the brain which is called as the hippocampus, okay. This is one region of the brain where there is a strong physiological evidence that we are adopting a Habian learning mechanism. So, it is physiologically very much supported and in fact, it is the physiological support okay, that made the Habian learning mechanism quite popular. All right. So, this covariance hypothesis in fact supports Habian process of learning, it is saying the same Covia thing. Uh, co co covariance is indeed supporting the Habian. Only thing is that here the behavior is defined with respect to the average value, correct. So, it is there that it is going to stabilize. You see that when it when is it stabilized, okay? that means to say that the point where there is no further delta w k j taking place that is at its average value, okay? that is at this point, okay? where is it going to be stabilized. Any other questions, any other observations that you would like to add at this point? Okay. Good. So, uh, we can go over to the next uh, mechanism of learning, which we can call as the competitive learning. Competitive learning. Yes, please. Please feel free to ask questions. Delta W k j as 0, yes. 
delta w k j yes if delta w k j is equal to 0 in that case there is no further updating of weight that is taking place. In fact, that means to say that it is within its average behavior. Okay. We do not have to modify its strength support it I mean that is what the covariance mechanism is telling us that if it is doing its average mechanism I mean if it is following its average behavior you need not have to alter it. What you have to do is that if both are going in the same way strengthen it okay. if one is going this way other is going other way okay, weaken it that is simply what it is saying that is the translated form of the Hebean rule. Your observations are absolutely very correct. So, I think with this in mind we can proceed to the next variant of the learning mechanism which we are calling as the competitive learning. Now, again competitive learning is something which is quite interesting. Okay. You see so far what we have seen for the Hebean is that we had considered existence of two neurons right pre synaptic post synaptic. In fact, that is I mean not the only two neurons in the system there will be many other such neurons existing in the system and so that means to say that typically there will be several inputs several outputs okay. they will be connected to each other by synaptic weights. Now, a Hebean mechanism means that there could be that more than one number of output neurons active remaining active that is quite possible that more than one output neurons could remain active because I mean it is it is, it is not restricting anything that uh, only one of the output neurons will be active and at the cost of others. Okay. Now, what happens in the case of competitive learning is that okay, something like a rat race. You see in a competition what happens? In a competition okay, there are I mean uh, several competitors I mean in, in any, any competition take a competition in a real life. What you have? You have several persons who are competing. Let us say that the first position in the class I mean being the topper of the class okay. it is competitive. Okay. Now, what you are having is that you are receiving the same set of inputs I mean all of you are uh, listening to the same lectures from the teachers okay. all of you are uh, reading from the same books more or less okay, unless one uh, suddenly finds out some uh, I mean uh, some text material which he does not want to disclose to the others okay, that also happens in fact, I am coming to that. Okay. But otherwise I mean given a situation that everybody is listening to the lecture I mean to the same set of lectures everybody is also uh, having the same text I mean the prescribed texts are also the same and there is a competition what happens is that out of let us say 40 students in the class, okay. one is going to be the topper and other 39 are not going to be the topper right simple mechanism. Now, here what happens is that I mean the set of inputs will be all your learning materials, lecture notes etcetera, etcetera and outputs will be your final performance and I am not uh, referring to the uh, marks that the students are getting only a classification that somebody is a topper and somebody is not a topper I mean something like a binary classification that we are getting. Now, here what happens is that the uh, topper and the other competitors I mean there are several competitors there are 40 competitors who are existing in the class. Now, uh, we not only get and strengthen our I mean those who are competing they not only try to strengthen themselves with the kind of inputs that they receive not only that they also try to weaken others. Okay? I mean it happens I mean uh, do not tell me that it uh, does not happen in real life it can happen in fact I mean if you find a very good material okay, for study okay, 
then uh, I mean you may disclose it to a friend who is not going to be your close competitor, but if you are contemplating to be the topper of the class, okay, certainly you are not going to tell all this information to the person who is uh, closely following you in the rank, I mean who also is equally competing in, in order to become uh, the topper. Okay. So, that means to say that there is some kind of a relative inhibition between the competitors. So, the competitors they are inhibiting amongst themselves, but they are trying to strengthening, they are trying to strengthen the uh, I mean all the connections which are there in the fit forward mechanism. Fit forward mechanism means from the learning material to the output performance, there whatever is the flow, there it is being strengthened and within the competitors it is getting weakened. And finally, it is one who is the winner, okay, the others are loser. Now, in real life it is such that if one person becomes the winner, okay, if he is the topper of the class this time, okay, it does not mean that in the next semester okay, he is going to repeat the same performance or there is any special preference for that person who has become the topper. Okay. I mean in fact, uh, I mean it, it should not be done that way that uh, we I mean support the person who has already become a uh, topper, we try to help him more so that he becomes the topper next time. Okay. We do not do that, we try to have equal opportunities for all once again. So, if somebody has become a topper in this semester, well and fine, he is the topper of this semester, but next semester again it will be based on equal opportunity of learning and uh, next semester somebody else could be a topper. But in the case of neural network what happens is that if somebody is a topper, okay, then he will be favored, he will be favored in the sense that the synaptic connections will be so modified that next time it will be easy for him to become a topper. Something like, uh, uh, something like an examiner who will uh, follow the policy of partiality, you know that if I know that a student is already good, I mean he is the topper of the class, then I will try to give him more marks and I will help him in becoming the topper, okay. something of that mechanism but it happens in the case of competitive learning. That means to say that in the case of competitive learning what happens is that the uh, winner okay, will be favored next time. So, the winner will have preference in terms of the synaptic connections. Okay. So, this is the uh, spirit of the competitive learning. So, in the case of competitive learning what we are going to have is uh, of course, some input layer, okay. let us say that this is a layer of source neurons okay. and then we are going to have an output layer. Okay. Supposing we just show three neurons which are there in the output layer okay. and now in the case of competitive learning they will be fully interconnected. Fully interconnected means that all these four inputs will be connected to all the output neurons followed. So, this will be connected to this four. Okay. Let us say that this is uh, output neuron 1, let us say okay. or let us say, let us number the neuron 1, 2, 3, 4 and supposing this is uh, I mean the output layer wise we are going to call it as let us say 5, 6, 7. So, I can say that this is W 5, 1, W 5, 2, W 5, 3 and W 5, 4. Okay. And likewise we will be having W 6, 1, W 6, 2, W 6, 3 and W 6, 4 and likewise we are going to have W 7 1, W 7 2, W 7 3 and W 7 4. Okay. So, all these three neurons who are supposed to be competing amongst themselves, they are connected to the 
same set of inputs. Okay. Why? Okay, that reason you think over later on. Okay, everything I should not tell you. But uh, here you see another. Uh, so all these things. I mean, all these connections that I have shown so far. That means to say, these connections that I have already indicated by the arrows, they are the feed forward connection. Feed forward connection. In fact the feed forward connections they are excitatory in nature they are all excitatory connections okay and over and above the excitatory connection in the feed forward we are also going to have some feedback connections or interconnections between the output themselves so like what 5 connected to 6 6 connected to 5 okay 6 connected to 7, 7 connected to 6, 5 connected to 7, 7 connected to 5. Now, all these connections I have deliberately drawn with dotted path, meaning that all the feedback connections which I have drawn with a different color of pen, okay, all these feedback connections they are going to be inhibitory in nature. That means to say that the competitors never support themselves. Okay. They only try to weaken the other competitors. Okay. Now, what happens is that the competitive learning network okay, follows a mathematical model like this. It is it's, it's going to follow a very simple mathematical model. It says that y k that is the output of the kth unit, the output kth unit will be equal to 1 if v k, what is v k? Again the combined uh, uh, response. Okay. If v k is greater than v j for all j, right? Where j is not equal to k right and y k is equal to 0 otherwise okay this mathematical definition is not at all difficult to follow it it just follows from the definition of the competition itself that means to say that if v k happens to be the highest amongst all the neurons then that is going to be the winner and if it is the winner, its output y k is going to be 1 and otherwise if v k is not greater than v j at least for some j's v k is not greater than v j, then it is surely a loser. Then we have got more output strength available with some other neurons and that is going to be the winner, but certainly not this one. So, this is the very basic definition okay. and another thing which a competitive learning network okay, always constraints is that the sum total of the weights okay, to a particular neuron. That is to say that if we consider the neuron k, then the summation of w k g, okay, meaning what? That for the kth neuron, all the inputs that it is receiving, if you sum them up, that means to say that if you sum them up over j, in this particular example, if you sum it up for j is equal to 1 to 4, okay, then the summation of w k j will be equal to 1 for all k. Okay. This is another constraint that we define on the weights. That means to say that the sum total of the weights, sum total of the synaptic weights to any output neuron is going to be 1, meaning that summation of w 5 1, 5 2, 5 3 and 5 4 is going to be 1. Likewise, summation of w 6 1, 6 2, 6 3 and 6 4, they are going to be 1. Okay. And now, we are going to define the competitive learning rule. So, every learning mechanism has got learning rule, which we have understood by now. So, competitive learning rule states that delta w k j again 
delta W kj means how much of change of weight you are going to do. In that case, the rule is pretty simple. It says that W k j is equal to x j minus W k j if neuron k wins the competition, if neuron k wins the competition okay. and delta W k j is equal to 0 if neuron k loses. Okay. Again, think of its significance. This means to say what? That we are clearly favoring the winning neuron. In what sense? That if the neuron is loser, we do not bother to readjust its weight. If supposing 5 is the loser, if neuron 5 is the loser, in that case we are going to keep W51, W53, W53 and W54 as it is without doing any modification. And supposing out of these three neurons W5, 6 and 7, it so happens. So happens how? That the set of inputs that you feed, all right. the set of inputs that you feed is such that and the existing connections are such that neuron 6 becomes the winner. In that case, what we are going to do is that we are going to adjust the weights of W61, 62, 63 and 64. Okay. So, we are only going to adjust the weights of the winning neuron, but again are we going to increase the strengths of all the connections which are there to a winning neuron, yes or no? No. We are not going to increase everything because again we are constrained by this expression. So, if 6 is the winner that necessarily means that summation of W 6 1, 6 2, 6 3 and 6 4 that is going to be equal to 1. That means to say that if we decide to increase let us say 1 or 2 out of them, supposing we decide to increase W 6 1 and W 6 4 maybe to maintain this equation that is summation of W k g equal to 1 we will have to reduce some so that in total w uh, summation of w k j is going to be equal to 1 that adjustment we need to do. So, uh, here what do you conclude out of this? This means to say that if x j is very close to w k j then you are not adjusting the weight. But if x j is much deviated from w k j, then you are going to adjust it heavily. Heavily in what direction? Then you are going to have delta w k j as a large quantity. So, you are going to increase w k j. Please follow my point. If you have x j much greater than w k j, then x j minus w k j is going to be a large quantity delta W k j is going to be large. That means to say that you are increasing W k j. That means to say that next time you are going to have even more delta W k j value or lesser w, delta W k j value, lesser W k j value. That means to say that now, now that W k j has already increased, next time delta W k j is going to be small, okay. but even then there will be some positive delta W k j. So, in the next iteration W k j will again increase not by the earlier amount, but somewhat it is going to increase and likewise W k j is going to follow what? X j. So, ultimately W k j is going to be what X j is. So, that means to say that the connection weights that we have to follow, okay, those connection weights will necessarily be of that of the input pattern to which it has become a winner. Mind you, the very fact that the neuron k has become a winner for a particular pattern does not mean that the neuron k is going to be a winner for all the patterns. Topper of one subject or the person uh, uh, I mean having uh, I mean securing the highest marks in one subject does not mean that he is going to get highest marks in all the subjects. Okay. For a different subject, someone else may be the topper, 
okay. So likewise for a different pattern, I mean maybe that for a particular set of patterns, 6 is the winner and we are going to favor 6 for that. Favor 6 in one sense that whatever connection strengths we are going to have, those connection strengths will be as per this inputs 1, 2, 3, 4. And what is going to be the uh, and next time another pattern we feed for a different pattern, maybe the 5 will be the winner, maybe for a different pattern 7 will be the winner, maybe for another pattern, I mean for which 6 is already a winner, it does not mean that 6 will be winner for only one particular pattern. Any pattern that is close to the, the pattern which has caused its winning, okay, there also 6 could continue to be a winner. Well, possible. I mean, we could be feeding a large number of patterns, and in a typical situation, let us say that here we have only 3 neurons in the competition. So, I mean, basically, it is an open competition only, but the thing is that what we observe out of this competitive learning rule is that this rule has the overall effect of moving the synaptic weight vector w k. So, what is this w k vector? w k vector means the vector that we will be having as w k 1, w k 2, etcetera, etcetera up to w k m, let us say where m is the number of inputs. Okay. So, this w k vector and if x uh, is another vector whereby we define the inputs. Okay. So, if these are the set of the inputs x 1 to x m, okay, then the competitive learning rule has got the effect of moving w k vector towards the input pattern vector, input pattern vector x vector. Okay. Now, uh, I mean I can explain this thing in a uh, in a little more lucid way okay, and uh, I will uh, do that in the next class okay, taking a kind of a geometrical analogy okay, for the competitive learning and although I mean uh, I promise that I will be doing the Boltzmann learning in this class, but uh, we are running short of time. So, in the next class we will consider the geometrical interpretation, then the Boltzmann learning and also go over to the next topic. Is there any question? Yes, please. Yes. All the neurons, all the neurons. So, I have said the summation W k g equal to 1 for all k. No, if one of the connections, see this you have to maintain that means to say that the connection will be such that one will be boosted, one will be weakened. You see again another constraint will follow on the input pattern itself that you cannot arbitrarily select any input pattern, the input pattern also follow a constraint. Okay. Like say for example, input pattern of constant Euclidean length. Okay. In that case, if you are having some inputs high, there will be some inputs which has to be low. y k j becoming greater than x j, yes, we are not ruling out that possibility. No, but y k j in this case is a binary, I mean either winning the competition or losing the competition, simply that. W k j, yes, I mean in, in this case there will be some W k j's which are greater than x j and there are some W k j's which are less than x j's. So, uh, well, Yes, you are very correct, but uh, there this eta has to play a role yes. that if the eta is small, then the oscillation will be less, but if the eta is large, then, then the possibility of oscillation could be more, yes. So, so we talked about uh, these weights being modified, that is the uh, weights from the inputs to the output earlier. Yes. How do the uh, interconnection between the outputs modify, will they modify or do they not?
Yes, I mean uh, actually speaking the inhibitory connections are not mandatory, okay. but inhibitory connections may exist over and above the feed forward connection, but the learning mechanism that we have shown is for the excitatory connection, for the feed forward connection, not for the inhibitories. Any other questions? Yes? Yes? Uh, the thing is that all the inputs, yes, I mean uh, the sum total of that has to be less than 1, yes, sum to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean the, the xj also has to follow that constraint, whatever constraint is there with wkj, yes, the same constraint xj also has to follow, you are very correct. Function of? Function of feedback connection, yeah. We, we did not use it over here, but uh, feedback connections are inhibitory, means that this will further strengthen the win winner and this will weaken the losers, okay. We, we did not talk about the weights of the inhibitory connections, whatever uh, learning rule we have shown that is only for the feed forward connections, it is, it is only for these that we have shown the learning rule, alright, thank you very much.